Hey everyone, this is John. In today's video, in the second video of this Laplace equation on dot 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 series, we're going to solve a Laplace equation problem on a cube. This problem can be found in Cheng Lung Yu's Fall 2019 second midterm. Um, this, dra this blank exam is actually on my website, so please feel free to go on and take a look at this, but let's just take a quick look at this problem. So the first thing we're looking at here is, as I mentioned earlier, a 3D Laplace equation on a cube, right? So as I've been going along, step zero is to draw the shape. Okay, so let's go about this and draw the shape. So we're obviously in x, y, and z coordinates. Z, let's draw a cube here. Um, let's see. So we're told the bottom at the xy plane. Yeah, so we're told the bottom on the xy plane is equal to z. Is equal to zero right here. And then we're told at the top, so if at the xy plane at L is equal to f of xy. Right. So this is height L, length L, and then L. So it's a cube, right? And then everything else, all the other sides are zero. And then there's six sides. I'm not going to draw them out. And then we're told that the Laplacian inside this cube is equal to zero. Okay, cool. So now, the next step now is separate variables. So I want to presume you guys have watched the first video of this series, so we're going to try to zoom through this one. So this is the Laplacian in 3D coordinates. How I like to usually approach these problems is I like to separate my variables um, two at a time. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to define let u of x, y, z be equal to f of, uh, sorry, let's call it h of z. And then let's call this phi of x, y. Okay, so now if we plug this in into the PDE right here, right, what we find is that we're going to be equal to the Laplacian of x, y. So this is sort of my notation here to save space and time. Is equal to negative 1 over h d squared dh dz squared okay and since in the z direction as a part of the theme of separating variables here we have to decide the sign of the separation constant so if we look at the z dependent terms here in z we want exponential solutions and this is because in z we have non-homogeneous species. In X and Y, we want oscillatory solutions because in X, Y, we have homo species. Cool. So consequently, since we want exponential species here, we are going to want to have a, a differential equation with real numbers, right? So no imaginaries. So consequently, we're going to define our separation constant being, constant being a negative number here. So let's call it negative lambda, okay? So that's going to be this green circle right here is going to form our first differential equation. But now we have to continue separating variables. So we have to separate out the x and y dependence, okay? So let's also let phi of x, y be equal to f of x and g of y, okay? And then if we look at this differential equation, the, this differential equation here with the Laplacian operator, right? We first end up with this, okay? And then this is simply equal to partial phi, partial x squared, plus partial squared of phi, partial y squared, equals, you know, equals negative lambda phi, okay? And then if we substitute everything in, 
and then we divide through properly, what we should find is that we have this relationship now. dy squared, okay? So now the nice thing to notice, right, is that we have homogeneous species in x and y. So we want both f and g to have oscillatory solutions, okay? So what we're going to do is let's move let's move the y terms to the left hand side alongside our lambda. Okay. Remember that we want oscillatory solutions. So for oscillatory solutions here, oscillatory, right, we have to have a negative separation constant here. Because in order for this, this stuff I'm circling in blue to have oscillatory solutions in F, we have to have imaginaries, correct? So consequently, we have satisfied the right-hand side of the equation. But have we satisfied the left-hand side of the equation? Well, we can, admit, we can manipulate this equation, this differential equation, to satisfy what we need. So let's tackle part, th uh, part two now, which is solve the diffie Bear with me, I'll show you guys exactly what I'm saying. So let's first took, take a look at the g, the g side of the differential equation. Negative mu, okay? Let's move all the terms, all the constant terms to the right hand side, okay? Remember that we need to have imaginary solutions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply both sides by Negative, um, negative 1 to move the negative over. So this should essentially flip the signs of everything. So then we should have mu minus lambda, right? But where can we get imaginary solutions out of this? What we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to factor out negative 1 out of this, right? So this makes us have negative lambda minus mu, which is equivalent to the above statement the above equation, right? Now this, this specific line right here can be factored, can can be solved into its um, exponent, its, sorry, oscillatory forms. So our function is going to look something like this. Square root lambda minus mu times y plus c2 cosine, oh, running out of room, square root lambda minus mu y. And then if we apply our boundary conditions with our, with our just um, Dirichlet boundary conditions, so non-derivatives, right? We're told that C2 must be equal to zero. And then we're told that at L, we're going to also be equal to zero. But C1 can't be zero. So consequently, we have to find another way for this to be zero, which can be found in the oscillatory nature of si um, the periodicity of sine, the sine function. Pi, oh, that should be L right here, which conveniently tells us that n, uh, sorry, lambda minus mu is equal to n pi over L squared. Cool. And then this also tells us up here that our differential equation for g is just going to look like this. I'll sort of put this, I'll box this in green for emphasis sake. Cool, so we have solved for g. So now let's solve for, um, let's solve for f. So this was g, let's solve for f now. Okay, so our differential equation for f simply is a somewhat standard differential equation that we've hopefully seen before. And this function, uh, the solution for this is just going to look like the standard form. Nothing special about this. Plus c4 cosine square root mu x. And then if we apply the boundary conditions, um, you can also use your table for this. You will find that f of x, sorry, apply bc's. You'll find that f of x is equal to sine of n pi 
over lx with mu equal to n pi over l squared. Cool. So the steps of finding those are pretty similar to what we just did for g. Just um, instead of lambda minus mu, we just have mu by itself. So this tells us right here, so this relationship between what I'm about to do is underline in blue, right, tells us the value of lambda. So since lambda is also equal to n pi over l squared plus mu, that means lambda is equal to n pi over lambda, or over l plus n pi over l squared, which means that you can just add these together, and you have 2 n pi over l squared. So now what we're going to do next is we're going to solve for um, the h dependent, different the h differential equation. Right. And remember that we want these h's to be exponential. So our differential equation for h is going to look something like this: h times z. Oh, sorry, h times lambda. Right, and then this will be in the form of sitch and cautious. So h of z is equal to c four. Oh, so c5 cinch of square root lambda z plus c6 cosh square root lambda c. So if we apply the first boundary condition we're given, we're told that at at z equals zero, we're equal to zero. Okay, so is equal to zero. And in the last video, I told you guys to try to it's probably a good idea to have the graph of cinch and cosh on your cheat sheets. Remember that cinch looks something like this. And that cosh looks something like this. Oh, that was really bad. Let's do it again. So that means at 0, cinch is 0. So therefore, C6 cosh at 0 is 1. So C6 is equal to 0. Right. So then our um, H of Z function look something like this where our lambda is given right above here cool so now step three is to put them all together remember that we define u of x y z to be equal to f of x times g of y times h of z or phi of xy times h of z from the first step, okay? So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put these product solutions together. So um, I'm gonna call the product of, let's see, what do they call what they call them? I'm gonna put the product of c3, c5, and c1 all together as one big constant. So I'm going to call that big constant a of n, right? And then I'm going to pretty much just multiply everything together. So um, our g function looks like sine of n pi, n pi over lh. Our f, so this is g, our f is also going to look very similar, n pi over lx. This is f, and then our z function is going to be cinch, and then that's going to be the square root of this sum right here. So, square root 2 over n pi over l squared times z. Cool. And remember that we can take a infinite linear combination of these to still have a solution to our original u. And since we have two separation constants, we're going to have two summations. And these summations each start from 1. Because if we tested... Sorry, so the implicit assumption for all these differential equations I did was that I assumed that lambda is greater than 0. Um, if you test out the lambda equals zero case, you will find that there is actually a contradiction, right? So lambda equals zero cannot exist. So let's do that lambda equals zero case right here. So lambda equals zero. So let's do this. So this, we made the implicit assumption. Let's write it up here. Assume lambda greater than zero. However, when we have lambda equal to zero, 
right? For let's say, let's just test it out for f for these f cases here. We find that f of x is just going to be equal to c1. Um, let's call this a different uh, constant. Let's call it like c10 times x plus c11. So f at 0 is equal to 0 is equal to c11, right? But then we also are told that at l, we're also equal to 0 is equal to c10 l, right? The issue here is that l is not 0, right? l does not equal 0. But if but the thing is, right, if L does not equal 0, then C10, C10 must be 0. However, that just tells us that f of x is equal to 0 for lambda equals 0, which is just trivially a solution. Trivial. Consequently, lambda cannot equal 0, because otherwise we just get the trivial solution. And you'll notice that this happens for all of, for G, um, F, and H. So lambda cannot be equal to zero. Lambda can only be um, a positive number. And for lambda less than zero, the same sort of contradiction arises. Okay. So this is why n starts from one and not zero. Because if it were to start from zero, we would have a contradiction and the solutions would not be useful essentially. Okay. Um, yeah, so this would be our final PD, uh, sorry, our final solution. Sorry, our final product solution essentially. Right, but now um, we have to apply the initial condition, okay? Because we want to find the value of that coefficient a n. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to the problem, and we're told that at height l for z, we're equal to f of x y is equal to all this stuff. there all this stuff at L okay and then if you guys have watched my orthogonality video or if you guys have a good sense of orthogonality already what we find is that a of n is simply going to be equal to the initial condition integrated oh, over um, x and y um, times f of x, y, sine of n pi over l, y, sine n pi over l, x, dx, dy, divided by 2 n pi over l squared, l, double integral again, sine squared n pi over l y sine squared n pi over l x dx dy so if you watch my orthogonality video hopefully this will come naturally to you um the, the technique is a little bit long to be covering this video but this pretty much completes the problem your final answer will comprise of these two star things right here so you yeah that's basically it um, please let me know if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, and good luck.